All right, good evening. My name is Eric Carpio. I'm the director of the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center. Also serve as the chief community museum officer for History Colorado. Really excited to have you all here with us this evening. For those of you that are joining us online, we're broadcasting live from the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center in the beautiful San Luis Valley of Southern Colorado. So welcome. Before we begin tonight's program, in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archaeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. Before we get started, I do want to uh, offer a few acknowledgments. Um, I'm not going to catch everybody, <laughs> probably, uh, but I think it's really important that we um, you know, give thanks uh, and appreciation to those individuals who made just really a special day today uh, at Fort Garland um, possible. I'd like to start with the staff at History Colorado, um, the employees at Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, of course, who helped prepare for this afternoon's program. As well as all of the other History Colorado employees, I know we had several staff from our center in Denver mm -hmm. join us today, staff from our uh, museums in Pueblo and Trinidad um, and other places throughout the state join us. I'd like to give special thanks to Don DePrince, who's the new uh, Chief here, here. Uh, Executive Officer for History Colorado, began September 1st. So this, I think this is a great way to end your first month. Don, uh, Don joined us. <laughs> Part of the reason I want to uh, give uh, appreciation to Don is really it's through Don's vision when she served in the role as Chief Community Mus Museum Officer that she imagined probably more than four years ago, several years ago, this initiative that we now call our Borderlands of Southern Colorado initiative. It's an initiative that initially was um, imagined to uh, develop into exhibits at our three Southern Colorado museums that are uh, operated by History Colorado, including the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, but also our El Pueblo History Museum in Pueblo and our Trinidad History Museum in Trinidad. The initial vision was that we would tell this, um, the history of Southern Colorado through a borderlands framework. As we all know, Southern Colorado is a unique and special place because it sits at the convergence of uh, a multitude of indigenous nations. This is the northern edge of the Spanish colonial empire. We are standing on an area that was once Mexico, and then later, of course, the United States. This is also an area that is contested and was claimed by the French, by Texas, and by a multitude of other um, you know, organ uh, uh, you know, entities and countries you know, prior to this. So because of that, uh, there's been a lot of conflict and trauma inflicted on the region. Also, a lot of opportunity has been created as well. And so it's through Don's vision that this, uh, that this initiative was created. The program that we're here tonight is part of that initiative. Uh, we opened an exhibit in June of this year, on Juneteenth weekend, actually. Um, it's an exhibit that was in, done in collaboration with uh, just a tremendous artist, uh, Dr. Chip Thomas, also, named as, also known as Jetson Orama. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Thomas is with us here this evening as well. Uh, and it was really like his thoughtfulness, through his thoughtfulness and his creativity, really created a powerful installation uh, that we're really, we're really pleased to share again today with the community, but that will be a foundation for future work that we do here at the museum. Uh, also want to thank today, they're not in the room right now, but Sean Price and the Diné Navajo Dancers, who just provided a tremendous um, learning opportunity, tremendous uh, offering of healing and of hope uh, for this space. And so even though they're not here, I would like to offer them a round of applause. <laughs> we hope that uh, the relationship that has been uh, established with uh, both Sean, his dancers, and uh, the Diné community will continue 
you know, well into the future. So, you know, thank you, Sean, and thank you, uh, all of the dancers that made the trip out here this morning, or this afternoon, this morning. Um, the last group I want to thank is certainly our community, and in particular, those descendants of this traumatic history of indigenous enslavement, uh, many of which we've had an opportunity to meet in advance of the opening of the exhibit, many of which who are also present today at today's activities, is through your stories and your um, knowledge and your experiences that we have drawn inspiration for uh, the, the exhibit that is open, uh, the today's activities and the future work that we intend to do here at Fort Garland Museum. So thank all of you. Thank you, Teresa Maestas, the Vigil family, the Ortega family, Josette Sandoval, uh, Diana Archuleta, you know, all of those descendants that we've met. Again, I know I've missed several of you. Just you know, thank you again for that inspiration. I'd like to introduce another one of our really important partners in this project, uh, Virginia Sanchez. Virginia is a noted community historian, genealogist. Uh, she's an author. Her most recent book, Pleas and Petitions, is a really important book uh, detailing the history of Southern Colorado during the legislative period after uh, Colorado first uh, gained statehood. And so it's a book that I recommend uh, people take a look at if you want to learn more about not just Southern Colorado history, but Colorado history. Mm -hmm. Um, so Virginia, um, I'd like to introduce her up here because she's going to do the honor of introducing Dr. James Brooks, our featured speaker this evening. Virginia. James, you probably don't remember, about 10 years ago, I met you in Boulder just after Plea for Captains and Peasants was published. Oh, how nice. Yeah, so you you came up for my talk up there? Sure. I remember. I trekked yeah. on over there and I, I got to see it. It was at the Geo Geology Museum. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Well, anyway, we've become good friends and I want to tell you about James. He is a wonderful author. He's written lots of distinguished and award winning articles and books. And um, some of the projects that he's been working on, he was a featured speaker in the Smithsonian's Institution Symposium on the Other Slavery, Histories of Indian Bondage from New Spain to the Southwestern United States. And he has been a National Endowment of the Humanities Lecturer for Teachers Workshops relating to the borderlands of Southern Colorado. Along with History of Colorado, and Fort Garland Museum. I'm really, really happy that he's here in Colorado with us, and especially in Southern Colorado. And please help me welcome the distinguished professor and author, James F. Brooks. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you, Eric. Um, I wouldn't be here were it not for Virginia Sanchez because in the miracle of social media and Facebook was it last well, March and April that I discovered that folks here at, at Fort Garland were undertaking what I think is really one of the most courageous acts of community and public history that I've ever witnessed in my career. And that was to begin hosting here, both, both virtually and here at the fort, a series of, I think what they were called were memory sessions around the question of Indian slavery in the San Luis Valley and re broader in a, in a regional perspective. I saw that, that Virginia had posted something um, and I thought, you know, gosh, 20 years ago, <laughs> I published a book on this, and I can't believe somebody might have read it. What a miracle. <laughs> and, and so then Eric was kind enough to in, invite me to kind of listen in on some of these sessions. I thought they were beautifully run, especially in the sense that there was no recording, there was no uh, reproduction of the stories that were shared there. It was simply a safe space for people from the Valle to gather, either virtually or, or in person, and to share stories from their families that had been buried sometimes for many generations and only whispered about. 
And, and the reason, when, when I was invited to come out and talk about the book and some of my work, this, this notion of the tomorrow of violence is what people in the Valle today are living. It's so easy for us to say, oh, well, slavery ended in you know, 1865, or in, in New Mexico, supposedly 1868, but we know it continued considerably beyond that. But just because an institution of violence ends does not mean that the violence doesn't continue. And one of the most difficult things for historians and anthropologists in my field is, is to how do we tie this kind of transgenerational trauma into its past and into its future. And so really what I'd like to do today is talk some about, you know, I'm an historian for the most part, but I've, I've done, spent, spent some time around anthropologists and learned more uh, about um, how we can kind of trace some of these, these resonances of violence up into the present. Um, and then especially if we're able to, I, I'd like to let the community hear um, have an opportunity to talk. And, and I think, you know, our, our Navajo Atali earlier gave a beautiful performance of a, of a protection way um, and said that this was, was an honor of people of courage. I can think of no people more courageous right now than the people in the families of the Valle who were involved in the institution of slavery and the slave trade who are now wanting to talk about it and the descendants of those enslaved people who are kin as well as slaves in many cases. So I, I'll try to kind of fly over what I did with the book and then and we can get to a conversation more generally that uh, you all know where you are right now, um, but since we're streaming, God knows where, I thought just a quick kind of orientation. Colorado really kind of comes onto the hist national historical map with, with the gold rush of 1859. Um, our little corner of Colorado doesn't come on to the historical map really until the 1870s or 80s post-territorial period. There's a lot of turmoil that Virginia talks about in the petitions uh, book because uh, as we all know, really New Mexico, the state of New Mexico ought to extend all the way up to the Arkansas River, right? You know, the, the environment is the same, the people are the same, where it's, you know, Spanish-speaking people in the area. Um, but, What's most uh, often known about in this southern Colorado region is that we're the, the area of the, of the great Colorado coal fields. This is where uh, the Rockefeller wealth was made in many respects. This is um, the, the place of the great labor wars in, this, in uh, the early 20th century. Uh, uh, my partner and I are living up in, in Cokedale and have just the last few days. Here's, you know, the, the, you all real, know this quite well. This is the area of, of child labor and child exploitation, its own form of exploitation. Um, and of course, the, the, the place where the Colorado, the violence of the um, Ludlow Massacre unfolded. That's, if you ask any, most historians and most people who have studied American history, why does Colorado matter during this early period? They'll say, well, it's the, color, it's the labor wars. It, it, it's all about that, that industry. I came down here 30 years ago and did field work on what I thought was an, uh, an unexplored aspect of the region's history. And that was that there were settlements in the area prior to the, the development of industrial coal mining. And those were settlements that were established by Hispano immigrants who had come up from northern New Mexico up into the San Luis Valley in the 1850s and up into the Picawar Valley in the early 1860s and had had a whole story associated with them that we never talk about that we had a whole generation of, uh, of 
settlement in, in history that very few people knew about. So, so my goal in coming down, I was at the University of Colorado at the time, was to try to write a history of that early Hispano settlement in, in this region. Um, luckily, Virginia took off and did that for us, for Cuchara. Thank you very much, a great book. Um, because I got sidetracked. I started doing oral histories up and down the valley with the descendants of these early Hispano settlers, the pobladores. And one, I discovered that although uh, the coal industry had kind of come in and landed on top of their subsistence farming and ranching operations, they had a mixed reaction to it because in many respects, they uh, suddenly found themselves uh, with markets that, that would purchase their sheep or they were there with their lamb or their hogs or their cattle and that was kind of wonderful. They also found ways of working the coal mining system that during the winter when it was cold they would go into the mines and work in the mines and in the summer, when it was nice, they would go and they would run their flocks and their herds, but they would also timber and sell that timber to the coal mines in order to, to frame up and, and support the, the uh, tunnels and shafts in the mining industry. So it was some, not anything I had expected, uh, and that was new. What I had also not expected was to discover people in these oral interviews making glancing reference to Indians in the family. These are, are people who identified as, as uh, pure sp descendants of Spaniard uh, conquistadors. They, they celebrated their limpieza de sangre, the purity of their Spanish blood. And sometimes they would, uh, but they would slip and reference, well, there was an Indian in that family or whatever. Usually in relation to some other family not their family, and often in, relate, in, in kind of phrases like, well, you know, they're still a little darker than we are. Right? However, in one case, down, I, I was in, in Weston, uh, which is, was called La Junta, doing an interview with um, a couple, very well, older couple, Ray and Sadie, and Ray was, gosh, almost 90 at the time. He spent a better part of his life in the mines, uh, was uh, terribly foreshortened having worked these narrow er, uh, seams, um, but very, very proud of his peninsulare heritage and talked a lot about how that, that family had meant a lot to him, the, the purity of their blood. Uh, and at one point, he excused himself uh, to, to go use the restroom and, and left the kitchen where we had been sitting. And Sadie turned to me and she whispered, his grandmother was an Apache. And that was, and then she was quiet again. You know? And I thought, well, wow, that's, that's something I hadn't liked or expected to hear. That's what started me on the research path that produced the book, uh, Captives and Cousins. Because I started chasing down these hints and little leads um, that, oh, here we go. This is uh, up, up the canyon a little bit. Here's the Madrid Plaza. These are the kind of settlements that, that were being established in the time. Um, but it led to, to this book, because what I discovered was that there were many, many, many hundreds and finally thousands of Native American people hidden inside these otherwise pure Spanish families. And I thought, woo, this is a complicated family relationship. This is taking kinship in a whole different direction. Um, while I was doing that and publishing this book in the early 2000s, a colleague of mine, Alan Galley, who I never even knew was working on it, was working on the Indian slave trade in the Southeast, the colonial Southeast. Our books came out at the same time, and suddenly there was like this new field of early American history. Because I never knew anything that Alan was going to tell us that in the colonial southeast, thousands of American Indian people were enslaved by early English colonists and shipped into the Caribbean to work on the sugar plantations, the sugar cane plantations there, in order to raise the capital to purchase African slaves and import them into the Carolinas and Georgia. 
because it was a lot better to have imported African slaves who didn't know the countryside and could not run for shelter in the way that if you enslave Indians and try to make them stay in their home territory, they're gonna disappear overnight. So they would ship the Indians to Barbados and to Jamaica and wherever around the Caribbean in order to raise the gold that would purchase. So we discovered, Alan and I, completely unexpectedly, that there was an American Indian slavery history that was intimately connected to the slavery in the Atlantic world. No, we had, had no, no expectation this is where we were gonna go. And that has been a lot of what I've worked on over the last um, years or so. But the story here in the Southwest, it's important to understand that the Spanish crown outlawed the enslavement of American Indians in 1542 in the new laws of the Indies. This was after the searing indictment of Bartolomé de las Casas in his critique of the early colonization of the Americas, where he really just singed the, those early conquistadors for the way they had treated American Indians. And so this was supposedly this great humanitarian moment that the, that the new laws said no more Indian slavery. The only way that slavery would, would be allowed was in just wars. If an American Indian group attacked a Spanish colonial settlement, then all those suspensions, those were off. That the, there you could pursue those enemies, capture them, and enslave them as punishment for the fact that they had, had assaulted a Spanish colonial uh, person. This is a, the, one of the few examples of a, uh, a Spanish dragoon of the period in the, in the early 1700s. Um, but keep in mind, this is the only way that under Spanish law, the enslavement of Indians was possible. So what on earth are we doing finding hundreds, if not thousands, of American Indian children, especially women and children, in Hispano households in the 18th century and the 19th century? There's a whole kind of cultural cre creation that happens during this period that allows us to go ahead. And many of you know this, especially those of, of you from the Valle, uh, that you probably grew up with some of these uh, terms and ideas. The, the notion of rescatar is, is key to the way that slavery unfolded in, uh, in New Mexico. And that is that through the principles of rescue and redemption, Spanish colonists could go to the trade fairs that were held in Taos and Pecos Pueblos for the most part. Comanches and other raiding groups from the plains would bring captive children from other uh, Indian groups, especially Apaches. Utes would bring Navajo children and women into the trade fairs. And in exchange for goods of some substantial value, sometimes even horses and guns and things like that, the Spanish colonists could feel like they had rescued this child or this woman from a life among the heathens. And they had redeemed their souls because they would bring them into the church and have them receive baptism and then move into another key verb, criar, the process of uplifting and civilizing these children and these women to become good citizens of the Spanish Empire. Now, as certainly Virginia and others in this room know that this is a, a thinly disguised version of building servitude uh, in, into these relationships. That even though people claimed you could work off your service, over 10 or 20 or 30 years. You could, you could repay the cost of your redemption. It was very rare that anyone was ever able to do so. Most of the criados and criadas that are brought into Spanish families spend their lives there. Most of those also either experience 
sexual abuse and have children by the master, or get moved around into other families, and ultimately kind of disappear into the social landscape of, uh, of colonial New Mexico, except for a certain group who I'll get to in just a moment, uh, who we know now as the Heniceros. These are military slaves, militarized slaves, who serve to protect the colony from these same barbarians. Um, and, and so what I argue in this book is that what we have here is actually a form of slavery that we really haven't thought about much uh, until we pull back and take it in a, a global look at it. And it's a form I call borderland slavery because the people on both sides of the cultural divide, whether they be Span uh, Spaniards or Indians, they're roughly equal in military power. And they begin to get engaged in a reciprocal slave raiding process that I'm sure many of the local families have family stories here of Comanche raiders and Apache raiders, Ute raiders who would come and steal children. We all know, you know, these are common stories. We, you probably know people who, within you know, a matter of grandparents or great grandparents, who were taken captive and then redeemed later. So you have Indians engaged in their own slave raiding along with Spaniards engaged in slave raiding. And that means that, that children and women are moving across cultures in ways that help to form the very culture that we see in the San Luis Valley and northern New Mexico today. It's this strange blend born of violence. It's the tomorrow of violence. Um, one case in point is are the Comanches are by far the kind of the leading slave raiders among Indian people in this period. Ultimately, you know, as best as I can tell, roughly 4,000 American Indian slaves entered New Mexico during the, the period I studied. Comanches take 4,000 Mexicans out of northern Mexico in a 20-year period between 1820 and 1840 in their slave raids into, into northern Mexico. They're doing it, one, as tools of an expansion, uh, expansionistic American empire. We are allowing guns to flow into Comancheria, Coman the Comancheria because we know they're going to destabilize Mexico, and that works very nicely if we're going to run, if we're looking forward to a Mexican war. Um, but also because what they're doing, the reason they're making these raids is that they need to have women and children for their industrial enterprises. And those industrial enterprises are the bison hide trade and the cattle trade. And I hope I've got these slides sequenced right. Yes, here's, here's George Catlin rep, you know, representing a Comanche raiding group in the 1830s. Um, and who are uh, also brilliant bison hunters and you know, incredibly courageous, powerful, important, taking tens of thousands of bison by the 1830s and trading them at Bent's Fort. But what's important for bison, if you're going to trade a bison hide, you have to have it treated. And who's going to treat a tenfold increase in bison procurement by Comanches once they have horses and guns and a market to sell them? This is why they're taking women and children as slaves because they desperately need that labor to scrape those hides, to work those hides, to tan those hides, and make them available that you can run them over to our beautiful Bent's Fort that I visited for the first time in my life the other day, um, where the, you see the big hide presses, where they make those bales of, of bison hides. This is, this is you know, the in intrusion of classic American capitalism into the American West. And who's going to do the work? It's going to be women and children from New Mexico and Mexico. If uh, any of you in the livestock or grew up in the livestock business like I did, how much water does a horse need every day? Anybody remember? Five gallons of water a day. Let's say you've, got, you've just uh, stolen a herd from, from northern Mexico of, of 1,000 horses and run them up across the Rio Grande. Who, who's going to get those horses watered every day? 
That's why you take eight to 12 year old Mexican boys. And you'll see a photographic image of one of these in a minute. So this is that backing and forthing of slavery that I think is really important for us to keep in mind. This is, a, is one of my favorite uh, images from the Times, 1853. This is a Kiowa encampment. Kiowas are involved just as much as Comanches. But as near as I can tell, these garments are not American Indian women's garments. Those look a lot to me like Mexican women's garments. I think that these are captive women who are working in the camp. They're, and they're, they've been brought across the border and set to work doing the kind of work that is, is desperately needed in the time. Um, likewise, there is a transfer of people who then become the very people who have captured them. And the, the great case of this is George Catlin is out with the first U.S. Dragoon expedition into the plains uh, in 1833. They encounter this, cal this cavalry unit of Comanches who ride up to them, led by this man on horseback with his white flag of truce, you know, let's parley, let's talk. Um, they have, you know, there's no, no violence between them. Catlin later paints the, his portrait here. This is the same man. And then he carefully writes down the man's Comanche name. Does that sound like Comanche to you? This is our man, he's Jesus Sanchez, right? And yet, he is a Comanche war captain. And he's the guy who's put out front. And what's great about this is that uh, Adamson Hobels, an anthropologist who works with the, Comanche, or the Comanches in the, 18, in the 1930s out on the reservation, and he's really he's the guy who, who probably put together the best ethnographic material we have for the period. But he asks them about this. They, he says, like, you put a, a New Mexican captive at the front of your cavalry unit? that's going to meet the U.S. Dragoons for the first time. And his Comanche informant said, well, you don't think we'd waste one of our own, do you? <laughs> so, you know, that, that, this is the way borderland slavery unfolds in that area. This is another beautiful, the, look, the Spanish girl, a prisoner among the Kiowa. She's actually the wife of a Kiowa, major Kiowa chief, one of his many wives, Big Mountain. Um, and, and here she is. This is, I think, 1853 that this painting is done. And it, this is complicated, too, because she's, she's got a nice mule, right, a riding mule, saddle mule, and a first phase Navajo blanket, which is really nice. But Chip, that's, yeah, you don't, that's not just any saddle blanket. That's a really nice blanket. So you, there's this kind of confusion of statuses. She's a prisoner, a slave, a wife, you know, a slave wife, and yet she's also given this kind of elevated position by having a, a nice saddle mule and a very nice blanket. But look at this photograph. Can, can you read the... Uh, Caption, captive, caption there. It says, Mexican boy, Comanche captive. That was taken in 1889, I want to say. <coughs> yeah, I think this is how late it runs. But he's been redeemed and released from the Comanches. Uh, and he's obviously been taken pretty recently. So this, this cross-border raiding um, it is long-term. It's, it, it's really more than a century long. It's so damaging to Mexico that after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed, there convenes an international tribunal to try to settle the damages that the, Mex the Comanches and Kiowas and Apaches that the United States has armed and unleashed on Mexico uh, you know, in violation of every international law, that that's just, that's just conquest by proxy, right? That there are actually attempts to come up with a, a dollar value to the damages, the Comisión Pesquisadora, and it comes, I think it's like $12 million or something as a final settlement, which is not even close to being legitimate. But, so that's one part of the story. The other part, and this is much closer to home, and I really appreciate today was a special day with the Dineta dancers. Um, 
I don't, some of you probably have been up into the, the, the region called Dineta, the, the place of Ma Navajo emergence, which is up around kind of Tapacito Canyon, Canyon Largo. It's south of the San Juan River. It's between um, the Jicaria Reservation now and say uh, Farmington and, and Ship Rock, certainly in there. Um, and if you have been up, you, you may have noticed that all over in this country are these strange little, what look like Puebloan fortified sites. There's like more than a hundred of them in that area. This is the consequence of the first recorded Spanish slaving expedition up into Navajo country. 1705, Roque de Madrid uh, says he's going to go, or sent up there by the governor to punish the Navajos for stealing sheep from the pueblos down in the Chama Valley. What's really going on is that it's the act of military conquest. Many captives come back with that expedition. Uh, and this is a map that actually shows how Roque Madrid passed through here. This is, is Chama here, there over. This would be um, the Jicaria over here, uh, Lajara Canyon, Tapacito Canyon, and the, and the engagements that come down. But what's, we, we seldom think of this as being, this is what early Navajo uh, houses looked like. This is between 1730 and 1750, hundreds of these fortified masonry communities are built up in the Dinata, and it's because they're trying to protect themselves from Spanish and Ute slave raiders. This is when the, the slavering expeditions really take off. And, it, and it's, it's a really it's a very little unknown story. This is behind, there's a massive wall, stone defensive wall here. This is a classic fork stick hogan. Uh, but it's defended now by these like almost like, like medieval castle sites. Uh, the, and, and it shows that Navajos were indeed the foci of, um, Slaving expeditions very early on. The highest number we, of, of the four so, or so, so thousand slaves that we're able to identify through the baptismal records that I referenced, the, the process of rescatar, the, fur, the highest number are Navajos, more than 2,000 of those. The second highest number, oddly, are Utes. And so the, even though Utes are often allied with Spaniards, as in these slaving expeditions, they too are being slaved upon. And so it's, it's a very um, complex situation. One of the things I really, I, I write about though in the book is, is this is why one particular of these fortified locations called the Francis Canyon Pueblito. And it's got a very unusual feature. It's got a Spanish-style Pueblo fireplace, corner fireplace. What is that doing in a Navajo house, right, fortified house? Well, in 1680, during the Pueblo Revolt, Navajos come down into the Bernalillo area, and they take two, they, uh, raiding a uh, uh, rancho down there, but they take two young Spanish women captive an Almasan and a Peralta woman in their teens and take them back up into the Dineta. Well, about 30 years later, a Franciscan padre goes up into that country trying to spread the word of Catholicism. He's throw, you know, they throw him out of every other community. People pitch rocks at him and say, go, go away, we don't want this stuff. In one of those, though, he is welcomed and the residents even know some of the uh, basics of uh, celebrating mass. And so I argue in the book that this may be the place of origin of the, uh, new, the Mexican clan, the Nakaidine, which, Chip, you're nodding your head. These two women may have been the clan mothers of the creation of the, the Mexican clan uh, that's so important today. Who knows? Um, finally, the reference I made earlier to the militarized slaves of New Mexico, the Geniceros. This is a Spanish version of the Turkish word janissary. 
Uh, Janissary is, is from the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans, every time they would conquer a territory, would demand what they called the divshirma, the boy tax that every year each conquered village had to send a certain number of boys back to uh, Constantinople, and those boys would be raised up as military slaves. They were some of the most powerful and, and important military units in the Ottoman Empire. Well, that notion gets transmitted to New Mexico, of all places. And we have units of Geniseros, of Janissary militarized slaves, as early as the 1730s and 40s in the colony. And they continue to identify as such today, as a different kind of indigenous ethnic group. Uh, there's this book, Nacion Genisera, just came out last year. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a study of, like I think, just 12 different essays in there talking about the Genisero identity experience in New Mexico, all the way from Caranoe up to Abiquiu, all over. There's, I counted at the time, like 1780, I think I counted. 14 Hanisero settlements. Ojo Caliente is one, Ranchos de Taos has Hanisero's. But Abiquiu is uh, the core of, of Hanisero identity in, in the area. This is Virgil Trujillo, who um, is, is really the leader of the, of the Abiquiu Hanisero's. And he's uh, firing off his muzzle loading musket in celebration of a, of a ceremony I'll get to in a minute called the Entrada de las Inditas, the entrance of the little Indian girls. Um, but I also, this now, if you ever look at the cover of my book, you'll see that what I re reproduced there, does anybody want to hold it up, is a hide painting that's in the uh, museum down in Santa Fe that features these images. So you can see it in the book that they're actually a cavalry unit that's attacking a small, probably Plains Apache community where the women have been hidden behind a, a kind of a palisade. Um, and the men are coming out on foot uh, to defend themselves. And these attackers are all on horseback. They're wearing classic Spanish, these leather cueras are horse armor that a lot of the Spaniards used. And so people initially thought, well, this is, is a Spanish military slave raid against these Apaches. But the odd thing is that every single one of those guys, except for this priest, every single one has a different kind of headdress. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wait a minute, what is, what is the artist trying to tell us by putting a different headdress on every one of these cavalrymen? And I think what this is, is a Henisero slave raiding cavalry unit, equestrian slave raiders. And the way the, uh, the artist wanted to indicate that they came from many different tribes was to give each of them a different kind of headdress. We'll never know, but it was the best I could come up with at the time. Um, to get into move toward the present and this notion of the tomorrow of violence, as, as all of you who have grown up here in the valley know that there are celebrations that are associated with the seasons, usually around Christmas, where there, there are hints of this relationship that come out. One are, are the um, Comanche dances in the Pueblos. There is the, the, dan the performances of the defeat of Cuerno Verde in 1779, uh, Juan Batista de Anza's defeat right over here uh, below, below Greenhorn Mountain. This is a reenactment of that defeat that is, that is played out. And here's a, a villager dressed up as a Comanche. Then you have uh, a, the Spaniard uh, behind them. Those get, get played out. Uh, many of you will recognize this. This is from Talpa, which is down near Ranchos de Taos. This is uh, a, the reenactment of a Comanche raid on a village. This is the little girl who has been taken captive by the Comanche raiders. The Comanches will grab her and run out of the village and then rein up, stop, if they're on horseback, and return, return the girl, and she and all will go in for mass. 
And so what I suggest in the book is there's, there's, there's this kind of a romance that develops as the reality of slavery moves behind. We, and we, it's not so, so much an invention, but it's an attempt to work out emotionally some of the, the burdens of this, is by turning the violent past into a romance that it's, it's the struggle of different people to find a way to unite themselves. And the Comanche, uh, the, the dances where little girls are stolen and then brought back and returned into their communities is one way of showing how this happens. Many of you, do you, do you celebrate Matashines here up in the Valle? The Matashines dance? This is, is a... Is a <laughs> This is my, one of my favorites because the, this, this is the little girl, you know, the, the, who's subject to seizure. She's going to be married to El Monarco, who's uh, either Spanish or Aztec, depending on which village. Uh, this is, is, is a bison who is threatening her, and she's clearly not impressed. Uh, but these are the Matashin, the dancers, who the, this dance goes on for hours in some cases. But it's, it's what uh, Sylvia Rodriguez down in Taos calls the beautiful dance of subjugation. It's a way of taking the colonial violence and turning it into a romance, that this little you know, virginal bride will marry the monarch, and therefore things will be united and all. Uh, up in, in Abiquiu, even today, this was just a couple of years ago in November when they're celebrating Santo Tomas Feast Day, which is the feast day that's uh, dedicated to the uh, Geniceros of Abiquiu. You have the Entrada de las Inditas. These are the Indians entering the village. These are actually all villagers, but they're acting out their roles now as indigenous peoples who come in and bring these girls, the Inditas, into the village as a gift. They are given to, they, uh, the, the procession ends up at the church. The community comes into the Santo Tomas church. The girls are brought in, they take communion, and are taken into the, communion, into the community now as fully absorbed Indians, but also now Spanish in some way. So this is kind of where, where I would, would say we, we should open up for, to hear from others. That, that, uh, that's the story I try to tell in the book. The one thing I want to add from my, my work today is that one of the reasons I'm at the University of Georgia now, rather than UC Santa Barbara, I was also in Santa Fe before that, is that I was brought in to help the university and the Athens community work through a slavery issue. And that is that if you fl fly over our beautiful North Campus, we're the oldest public university in the country. It is a gorgeous North Campus. Um, every building on the North Campus was built by enslaved laborers. And there's absolutely no recognition of that anywhere. The university didn't own the slaves. They were smarter than that. They rented them from slave owners. So the university didn't have to carry the moral burden of being slave owners, right? The Athens community is 48% African American. The Athens is the town in which uh, the University of Georgia exists. Enrollment of African Americans at the University of Georgia is 8%. The inequalities, the structural violence, the, the kinds of issues on a much bigger scale, but all that the, the, you folks here in the Valley are, are kind of struggling with are existing clear out here in this, you know, this magnificent campus. Um, and what we're doing is, is trying to create a dialogue between the university and the town uh, between, you know, the, we got a lot of challenges in Georgia, I promise you that. Um, and try to reach some uh, movement forward about this tomorrow of violence. Uh, these are the stages that we're using. And I don't know if these are useful to you folks here or not, but first, recognition. Let's all recognize what happened. Let's say this is real that yes, there was a system of slavery, markets, violence, the craziness of slavery. 
that occupied our, our ancestors' lives in many ways. It was reciprocal, which makes it even more difficult because there's not simple victims and simple you know, villains. That it's mixed up in many respects, but let's agree on that. Then let's talk about what do we do to try to fix it? You know, how, or at least, you know, how do, what do we do to try to heal it? I, I don't know exactly. In the case of, of the Athens community, we're arguing, why doesn't the University of Georgia find out the, who the descendants of the enslaved laborers are that they hired and offer fellowships. Georgetown University is doing that. They, Georgetown sold a bunch of their slaves in order to keep the university going, and they have guaranteed the descendants of those slaves that they sold uh, enrollment and, and free tuition at Georgetown. Why can't the University of Georgia do something like that? So that, that's, you know, who knows what redress looks like in the San Luis Valley, I, I don't know. And then finally, once you redress these ills and the wounds, you can move toward reconciliation among the peoples. And I think you folks have made, a, you know, when was the last time Fort Garland hosted Navajo dancer and a Navajo singer who was offering a protection way, which is, you know, that's, that's a powerful song and a really important one to bring into a former military installation that was designed to suppress and terrify uh, your very people. So that's, I, if, if it's okay, I'd like to just leave it there and throw the floor open for comments. Thank you for listening. Did I leave anybody completely puzzled? That are the things that I can't, it's a really complicated story. If you want to wait through 378 pages, there's a book over there that tells. Yes, yeah. Do you know how many, uh, how many sort of land grant communities are still around? Oh, well, Abiquiu is one, Karanawe is one, or Ojo Caliente, yeah. Do you mind just for the online? Oh, sure. Oh, the question is how many Henisro communities um, I still exist. That certainly Abiquiu is, is the heart of the Hinesero world. But um, uh, one of the contributors or editors to that uh, Nacion Hinesero volume is, is from Karanoe, and, and that ha is a functioning community. There, the, um, I just ran into, what was it, a year ago, Francisco El Comanche Gonzalez from Aranchos de Taos who is also, he's one of the, really, the kind of the walking museums of Hanisero culture. You know, the, the, the struggle there is they very much want recognition as indigenous people. And in many ways, you know, it, that would be right. Um, because of mistranslation of the land grants, from Spanish to English. The, land, the Spanish was to Los Indios Janiceros de Abiquiu or Caranoe or whatever. It's translated into English as the half breeds of, and so they're deracialized in that process under American law. Um, but if that, that volume, if you get that volume, you've, that's the best collection that's out there. I'm really impressed. I just did a review of it this last year. So, yeah, it's it's fun. And Abiquiu's wonderful anyway. And the Bodie's store has the best breakfast burritos, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, is it? Am I right to think that the abolition of um, the indigenous people as slaves? Predated the Taos Revolt? Oh, the, uh, no, the slavery persisted well in New Mexico in the law. I'm sorry, the question is did, did Indian enslavement end with the Taos Revolt or did it uh, continue on? And, and one of the things about uh, the book that what I think is the enduring contribution of the book is Appendix C, believe it or not, because in 1868, President and then President Andrew Johnson 
sends Oliver Howard, who's the former director of the Freedmen's Bureau, to New Mexico and says, let's put an end to all this talk about Indian slavery. Bring me a list of all those so-called slaveholders that are out there. And he does. He, and I reproduce in Appendix C every family that held Indian slaves in 1868 in New Mexico. He could not get a single indictment out of a single grand jury against this, any one of these families because all their neighbors are the jurors, right? Nobody's going nobody's to send their neighbors up. But if, for, if you're a research-oriented person like Virginia, Virginia, you, you could write books for the rest of your life just out of that appendix, I'm sure. Because as you know, those records exist. You know, We can find those families. That, Showed a map that um, had Kanoniago there. Yeah. Okay. Found a, an oral history that takes some traders, Comancheros, in, and um, they meet some, these are from southern Colorado, Comancheros area, uh -huh. who meet up with um, some Nuevo Mexicanos, and they are actually traveling to the Mojave area. Oh, is that right, in Canyon Largo? Yeah, yeah well, I, if you haven't been up in that country, it is my favorite part of New Mexico is the Dineta country. It's just eye-poppingly beautiful, bare. These canyons are amazing. But yeah, I don't know. Did that answer your question that really there is never an emancipation of Indian slaves? There's, there's never a moment we can, there's no Juneteenth in New Mexico or, or the borderlands, unfortunately. That, uh, and, and you know, it's complicated, too, because even though slaveholding among Indian peoples uh, varied from tribe to tribe, there were some ricos among the Navajos who held slaves and held them even into the 20th century in one case. That you know, Zarcios Largo. So you can tell they're Ricos. They they got names like Ganado Mucho and Zarcios Largos. Hashkenizi was another who had big numbers of slaves to manage the flocks. Uh, but it was very rare. You know, it was a handful of slaveholders. Yeah. Yeah, Virginia. Can you talk about um, indigenous enslavement by the Mormons? Oh, well, uh, yeah, though I, I, what I would do is point people to historian Sandra Jones. Uh, if you want, the, the Mormons were up to their elbows in, in the trade as well. And it, it's, they're, they're especially among uh, Utes, Paiutes especially were vulnerable. You know, they had, Paiutes didn't have horses, they didn't have weapons, you know, guns. And, and so the predator, predation on Paiutes in the Great Basin was truly terrible. Ned Blackhawk's book that's in the bookstore here, it has a really good treatment of that called Violence Over the Land, uh, the experience of Great Basin peoples. Uh, let's see, any? Yes, ma'am. Um, does your book include I, they, they are, they are, yes, they are included, though they're not as nearly as involved in this aspect of, of the, the slave trade. They were uh, able to keep themselves well, more often than not, they served as military auxiliaries on Spanish expeditions, but Spaniards were never going to let an Indian take a captive to a trade fair and make money off them. So they would get you know, weapons, uh, sometimes horses, but they would very seldom get a, sl a captive that they could sell. No, the Kit Carson paid his youth scouts in the, their right to take Navajo children and sell them to Lafayette Head, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the ugly world. Uh, But I really encourage you all to continue the conversations that you've been having, because I think it's, it's just so brave of you to do it. And we, you know, we in Georgia need help. 
we, we need to know how these conversations go, that I know there's a lot of kin among white and black Georgians that nobody wants to talk about. There's a lot of blood. There's also kin between native and black. Yes, absolutely. Because that is the other half of the slave trade with the five civilized tribes. Yeah. You know, that, that is part of that Georgian region of oh, man, the major. that held black slaves as well. Yeah. You know, that were taken along with them on the Trail of Tears. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the many of the of the of what would come to be called the five civilized tribes, the elites among them at least adopted uh, the enslavement of Africans as well, and took them in. You know, part of the extension of slavery into the American West was done by Indian removal. Oddly enough, you know, it's like crazy. That's how crazy our history is. Yes, Virginia. Can you talk about Enslaved. En enslaved by Indians or, well, um, the numbers there, in, w w what's interesting to me is that the, the high, I think the highest incidence of enslavement of Hispano settlers by Indians is very early on in that, that kind of 1720 to 1750 period when the governors are pushing the pobladores out. They want the frontier to expand, but the governors aren't willing to protect them with presidial troops. So Oja Caliente loses 20 or 30 women and children. Uh, the first settlement at Abiquiu, Santa Rosa de Lima, is destroyed in a Comanche raid that I think 23 women and children are, are taken in. Uh, Ranchos de Taos, there's this amazing story, I tell it in the book, of a servant in uh, Pablo Villalpando's household in Ranchos is taken by Comanches as a captive sold to the Pawnees. Her name was Maria Rosa Vilpando. She had adopted her owner, her patron's name. Sold to Comanches. She's found by a French fur trader from St. Louis in the Pawnee villages. He marries her, takes her to St. Louis. She becomes Marie Rose Salé and the matron of one of the great fur trading houses in St. Louis. So she goes from being a servant in a household in Ranchos de Taos to being the matron of a fur trading empire in St. Louis. So they're not all terrible stories, but most of them are, I promise. So. Yes? So you, in a lot of the stuff you conveyed, uh, you talked about the women women in particular were subjugated. So what is, what is really the role of gender in, in all of these practices? No, it, it's, it's definitive, I'd say. That virtually no, no males over the age of 12 or 14 are even targeted. Uh, because women, women can do two things and this is glo the truth about global slavery. The women are always actually the prime victims because women can work and women can produce children and men can't do both. And so if you're gonna risk going on a slave raid, you are gonna take women um, because that's, they, they're the, they have the double capital value or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's like the Atlantic slave trade really skews our understanding uh, because men were f the focus of that because they were gonna die so fast in, in the Caribbean, in the sugar industry at least, that you had to replenish with that, that adult male labor power. And so that, that's what drives it. In most slave societies globally across time, women and children are the primary targets because they have re social reproductive value. Um, that, that, and, and you know, it's like, look at you know, who, who constitutes the missing and murdered indigenous women you know, in this country. They are, the, they are the targets 
of predatory raiders, you know, and it's, some things have not changed much, and, and they're not, you know, yeah, but it's a very, really good question. There's a pup. I kind of have not been paying attention to you folks over here. Then. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your scholarship. Uh, thank you it's, for it's very help, help me understand my family. Is that right? Can you would you be willing to share a story with us, or is that sort of, I don't want to put you on the spot, but no. <laughs> question was, question go go to was, your question. <laughs> can you speak? Have you followed relations, captives, and kinship as it relates after the eighteen seventy? to the 1920s, 1930s? The, the case that I think is absolutely fascinating is out of the Southern Ute Reservation, uh, and you all know Ignacio, that country, uh, the Pine River. Um, friend uh, Quintana, who's, who passed away some time ago, she worked both at Abiquiu and up at the Southern Ute Reservation. And she, you know, the Southern U Reservation was allotted in the 1890s with the Indian Allotment Act, where it's turned into fee simple ownership that was no longer tribal lands. It was like each, each Ute got 80 acres or 160 acres. Well, the Utes wanted to continue being the hunters in the forest Utes, and now they had this land that was supposed to, something was supposed to happen to it. And so they invited Hispanos from Chama and, and uh, the whole Chama River Valley to come up and farm their lands like tenant farmers. And I've never heard of a case of American Indians having tenant farmers working for them farming the land. Uh, but it's a kind of an inversion of that power relationship that I think is really fascinating. And then, of course, once you have Hispano families in Ignacio and at the Southern, you get these intermarriages. And, and Fran argues in, in her book, um, what is it, Ordeal of Change, about the Southern Utes, that you actually have many Southern Ute tribal members now who are descended from these Spanish settlers, and she calls them the Spanish clan of the Southern Utes. So that's one example I can think of. Um, but thanks for the question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is there any evidence of enslavement among Arapaho? I have found only in those baptismal records two or three that they don't use the term Arapaho because it's, you know, you have to go with the Spanish terms. I think they call them a -as, you know, double A. Um, but that's pretty far north, though I have seen a couple of cases of Crow Indians, which means they, they were traded somehow through the network from Montana all the way down into New Mexico. But it's mostly, uh, it's Navajos, Utes, Apaches, and then, and, and at one point, they're even, we're even getting California. Once this old Spanish trail is open, California Indians show up in the Lafayette Head Census. Where's Eric? Right? There, aren't there Cal California Indians in the Head Lafayette Head? Yeah, they've been traded backwards up the old Spanish Trail. Well, that astonished me when I saw that. Uh, right, yes, sir. And then we'll go back. Yeah. So my ancestor was one who, who purchased pi Paiute. Is that right? The Spanish Trail. Okay. And, um, the reason I asked the question about carrying forward the captive and kinship creados, mm -hmm. um, rescates, mm -hmm. continues into the 20th century really? in the family. And so it's, 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 it's hard. It's very difficult. Sure. Um, but it, um, cousins in my lifetime follow a line. And it's not, it's not captured uh -huh. in the 20th century. It's, but it's adoption in the same way. And, and so sure. um, when I read your book, it put pieces together, um, not always in an, in an uplifting way sure. within the family. Sure. And so I, I, um, 
But I think that anybody here who's from, and I'm not some of these other people, I'm La Cienega people mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. and South of Santa Fe, La Cienega, mm -hmm. yeah. Galisteo, mm -hmm. anybody from this region um, will know that it was a very exchanged place and relationships, working relationships. Um, and um, I don't think it really stops. In It stops in a certain way mm -hmm. in 1868, but the relationships, the labor relationships, yeah. the social relationships, family relationships, mixing in that way between the Hispanos and the Utahs and the Paiutes and the Comanche continue. Yeah. And so I, I, I would encourage a scholar like you <laughs> to continue that, that line because I think it, it does affect relations to this day. Um, I, I believe that you are right, and I believe that it would be really, really dicey, but important work to do, definitely. Um, because if you're scratching a scab when you start doing that. But that's how you sometimes heal. Thank you for, for your courage and sharing, think, sharing that family about story. Your, your um, recognition, redress, reconciliation, yeah. and some of our challenges that we've had in New Mexico in terms of memorials and monuments yeah. to, to people who committed atrocity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no one wants to talk about that Great Basin slave trade. It is a, it's terrible, at, at, you know. And so, you know, there's, thank you for sharing that and for carrying the weight. That's, thanks. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the differences between this, the Atlantic slave trade and the, the Spanish colonial era mm -hmm. slave trade and its legacy. And is it worth to talk about the differences? Um, I mean, because there's, there's, there's huge differences. Like, uh, for instance, you know, here with the Spanish crown, they allowed freedom at puberty or at um, adulthood often, often. Mm -hmm. But you didn't see that with the other Right, <laughs> right, so right. Can you, can you, uh, you know, I, uh, what I would, I, I think, didn't Eric, didn't we print out some of Andres Resendez's thought pieces. Um, we just finished doing a, what was it, a three-day symposium at National Museum of the American Indian on the other slavery with, God, I think we had 20 or 30 different, way better, more knowledgeable people than me. Um, and, but Andres Resendez, who wrote the book, The Other Slavery, which is really a hemispheric story that I tell this tiny little corner of, um, is really good about, yeah, we, we can pass that on to you. We have some copies here. Um, does a very good job of detailing the, the differences. One is that, you know, that, that we never really had legal support for the slavery here in the Southwest. It, Spain says, no, we outlawed it in 50, 1542. Uh, and so it all happens into this subterranean kind of family level, nobody talks about it, they invent ways of pretending it doesn't really exist, and yet there is also this kinship quality to it. Whereas in the United States, at least, you have, you have the power of the federal government uh, in, in the three-fifths compromise, right, in the freaking Constitution saying, oh yeah, slavery's it. fine. You know, we're gonna count every slave as worth 40% less than any white person. Uh, so that is one really important difference, I think. But it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, yes? I have an ancestor who came with one of the uh, expeditions from Mexico to New Mexico. Uh huh. And when they described him, they called him a full blooded Spaniard with somewhat curly hair. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it's the Banico, the Moor is the... Is the uh -huh. son of a Spanish man uh -huh. and his black slave. Sure. He had African slaves in Mexico. Sure, the sure. The difference between the South and Mexico is that they couldn't keep the slaves. They formed their own colony. Right. And right. Uh, so my ancestor was... Uh, 
Is that right? That's great. Well, there's a joke out in the Pueblo sometimes that people say that, well, the first white man we ever met was a black man, so, <laughs> which is at the Banico, right, in 1539 or whatever. And he also is he's assimilated into the Katsina uh, religion in the form of Chukwina, the black ogre, the black ogre Katsina, that uh, Zuni and some of the Hopi Pueblos. So, so he lives on in a different way. Yes, sir. You mentioned you found the evidence of importation of enslaved people into the region here in the southwest, but not evidence of that slave trade so much further north or uh, elsewhere. What, um, can you speak a little bit about why is it here? What is it about this place? That, was that, that is so involved in the, well, in, in truth, that's, it's much more widespread continentally than, than we understood. Brett Rushforth's book on, on New France is extraordinary because he, he discovers, you know, I make reference to Pawnee slaves being exported uh, into New France, but he finds them and counts them. And they're, the Indians are, there are Pawnee Indians serving in the French king's Mediterranean galleys at one point. That's how far the slave trade has gone transcontinental. And again, Andres Resendez's book is really great on broadening our understanding that I think we just, I stumbled on this story and, and because it was so intense in, the, in the northern Spain, especially because Spain just wages this predatory war of extermination against Apaches from very early on. Paul Conrad has a new book uh, called uh, The Apache Diaspora, uh, that Spain is, is determined to eliminate Apaches um, and ultimately is sending them to, to Cuba, to the Yucatan, to work in Hunnican plantations. Um, so, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great research question, is why is it particularly volatile and violent here? I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, that was really wonderful. Thank you all for your interest. I really appreciate it. <laughs>